Okay, as you've learned last week, some categorical distinction between male and female is important in all human societies. And in many human societies, this distinction is often taken to be natural and not a matter of individual choice and socialization. Now the anthropological puzzle arises because those characteristics associated with male and female as categories are First, quite different in different societies around the world. Second, they're ascribed to persons in different ways. And third, they're often experienced as paradoxical. So I want to, in this segment, suggest that we can't uh, understand gender as stemming directly from genitalia, um, as I'll illustrate with a quotation from a nursery school boy soon. And so we have to ask, where does it come from? How do boys become boys and girls become girls in culturally specific ways? How is gender difference made visible and significant? And while there are, of course, physiological, biological, genetic, evolutionarily adaptive differences between humans, human females and males, we tend to make those differences. We make more of those differences than our biology would require. So this issue is not one that is a mere academic one for me. And in fact, the reason I'm focusing on child socialization is that I've been deeply puzzled by it watching my little girl grow up. And as I say on this slide, my question is how did my daughter become a princess. My partner and I are both um, committed to a view of the world that doesn't really emphasize gender difference. We feel that women and men are more or less the same. We have the same kind of work. Um, we share household labor relatively equity equitably. We um, don't tell her she sh should act in a certain way because she's a girl. Uh, my husband uh, wanted to ban pink uh, until she demanded that. We limit her exposure to commercial television. Um, her early child care over at Unicare at UWA was a child care center almost entirely without pink and blue and with quite a number of male staff, although far more female staff than male staff. So our no pink rule lasted until the baby shower and at about two she began to show a very, very strong preference for girly clothes. She refused to wear pants. She wanted skirts that were twirly and she began to exhibit a strong preference for all things pink. She also started to really beg for high heeled shoes, makeup, jewelry. And she began to her puzzlement to divide the world into girls and boys. There were girl things and there were boy things. There were moms and dads. Moms drink tea, dads drink beer. Boys have long, short hair, girls have long hair. Now, um, it is pretty well attested that young children can be very dogmatic. They're not tolerant of ambiguity. They're learning the social norms and the symbolic codes that express those norms and they treat them seriously even if there's very little sanctions on those norms. They're trying to figure it out and they don't want anything between the categories they're learning. It's a black and white world but in gender terms in this particular society it's a pink and blue world. And an interesting thing with these norms as with so many other norms and stereotypes of gender, race, ethnicity is that the exception doesn't actually undermine the rule. Girls marry boys, they're moms and dads. So we told Anna, well, but what about your friends in kindy who have two moms? Hmm, <clears throat> no, girls marry boys, boys marry girls. Girls have long hair, boys have short hair. Yes, but what about so-and-so who's a boy, who's a man, who has long hair, and your grandmothers who have short hair? Hmm, <clears throat> no, girls have long hair, boys have short hair, and so on. Where did this come from? As soon as she began drawing, you can see her first, um, her first person there is a little man, but very quickly they became not just girls, but princesses. This 
this birthday cake sort of thing on this girl's hair, head is a princess crown. So you can see the evolution of her drawing skill there as she becomes four. She loves to draw. Christmas age four. The ban on pink was well and truly over. Santa Claus and her grandparents fulfilled her dearest wishes for a princess dress, princess crown, high-heeled princess glass slippers, and to our um, consternation, Barbie dolls. It wasn't just that Anna was drawing princesses. She was a princess, as you can see from this family portrait, the characteristic birthday cake crown on Anna. For nearly a year, she honed her drawing skills on princesses. Unless she was asked to draw something specifically different, they were princesses. They were often pink. They invariably had high heels. I can't really point to them in this, in this lecture capture, but these high heels down there, there were sometimes flowers and clouds. The style evolved, but the Princesses did not. When asked what she wanted to do when she was grown up in kindy, she said, I want to be a princess and draw, drew something like this. Just in recent months, um, the princess obsession after a year has, uh, has declined. I'm not so interested in princesses. I'm not so into princesses now. Mom, she said a few months ago, and she began drawing girls doing other things, still somewhat gendered, watering flowers in a garden, but also the rocket ships, the occasional monster, and so forth. One of the things I'm going to say in a minute is um, that this is completely uh, standard for girls, that they get uh, very focused on their gender identity and very adamant about it, two, three, and four, five, and six, they start to loosen up, are more willing to play with girl clothes, or boy Boy toys are, are more uh, expansive in their uh, interests, um, but the reverse is true for boys, which is quite interesting. So I am not the only uh, scholar and parent who has found the uh, gendering of her own children to be puzzling. Neuroscientist Lise Elliott, um, who's at the uh, University of Ch Chicago School of Medicine, was a uh, was similarly puzzled. She, she writes in her book, Pink Brain, Brain, Blue Brain, and I've linked a blog for you to get a sense of what she is writing about. She writes, boys and girls are different. This fact, obvious to every previous generation, comes as a bewildering revelation to many parents today. Raised in an era of equal rights, we assume or at least hope that differences between the sexes are made, not inborn. We mingle comfortably with members of the opposite sex, harangue as easily about sports as cooking, and cheerfully compete in the workplace all the while pretending the two sexes are more or less the same. Until we have kids of our own, at which point the differences are impossible to ignore. And she has a boy and a girl and was particularly concerned about boys. There are a lot of reasons to be concerned about little boys. Little boys are more at risk for learning and developmental disorders, more likely to die in accidents than girls. Girls do much better than boys academically all the way through university, although here it becomes more problematic insofar as women consistently earn less and are less, are more often underemployed than men. So neuroscientist Lise Elliott decides she's going to figure out what indeed is um, different about girls' and boys' brains, because it's not really an ideology, an explicitly held idea about the world, an ideology held by the parents. You've got parents committed to gender equity and experiencing sort of minimal gender differentiation whose kids are doing, you know, boy things and girl things. The girl is playing with the dolls and putting diapers on them. The boy is, as Elliot says of her own child, um, trying to shove as many things as possible into the VCR or DVD player. One is calm, one is rough, and so forth. And these patterns seem to be really um, vivid and clear. So what did Liz Elliott find? After an exhaustive search for innate kind of differences in girls and boys' brains, innate or, or developmentally different differences in girls' and boys' brains, she found 
surprisingly little solid evidence of sex differences in children's brains. And she said the two things that were clear is that boys end up with bigger brains and their brains grow into their late teen years. Girls' brains stop growing a little bit earlier, but the significance of those facts are not, are not really clear. The reality, she continues, judging by current research, is that the brains of boys and girls are more similar than their well-defined behavioral differences would indicate. So there are differences, but the differences do not at all show, um, explain why girls and boys behave so much differently. Um, she's, she has a chapter on um, the preschool years. And she's interested in the ways that this is a time when gender differentiation becomes really noticeable. Girls and boys become aware of their gender at age two or three. I've read some things on transgender kids for whom it's at that same age that it becomes really problematic to them if they're gendered in the gender they do not feel is their gender. Uh, there's robust findings, especially in weird uh, societies, Western educated industrial rich democratic societies about um, children's choice of gendered toys very very strong something like 97 percent of boys choose to play with boy toys rather than feminine marked toys if given the choice at this age um, this is particularly marked in the presence of other children so boys and girls are more likely to play with the toys marked for the opposite gender if they're alone in the room, but they are much less likely if there's another kid in the room, even if the kid is not really playing with them, which is really interesting. Elliot describes the possibility of some innate preferences that boys have for kind of mobile Toys, primates seem to do something similar, but very, very slight differences. Um, one of the um, one of the really interesting things I've already mentioned is that by five, girls are much more willing to play with boy toys than boys are willing to play with girl toys. Um, and, and basically what Elliot concludes is that, yeah, there might be some really kind of Minimal differences in girls naturally being drawn towards children, although little, little boys and girls are similarly drawn towards dolls. And minimal, minimal differences in boys being drawn towards mechanical stuff. But as children become aware that they are a gender, they are super conscious of um, identifying and expressing that gender identity through appropriate play. In the background here and in the next slide is this wonderful um, photographic um, project by an artist, Jiang Ni Yun, the Pink and Blue Project with the, the boys with their blue and the girls with their pink. So Elliot is interested in how um, practice, you know, whatever the innate differences are, um, that if a boy is constantly practicing with guns and toys and throwing things, he's going to get better at it. And not only is he going to get better at it, but his brain is probably going to change because our brains are incredibly plastic. And the same with girls with more nurturing kinds of, kinds of toys. What do adults do? Adults, even those who don't adhere to a really dichotomous gender ideology, often subtly respond differently to children who are playing with the wrong gendered toys. And again, especially boys playing with girl toys. And yet, despite this pressure, many children don't conform to these quite strong stereotypes, which affirms that yes, there's a lot of variability. Uh, variability that Elliot talks about in terms of hormones, even prenatal hormones and things in terms of more masculine and more feminine, more aggressive and less aggressive kinds of um, uh, orientations, um, but, but those exceptions to gender stereotypes and other stereotypes don't undermine them. So here's an anecdote that Elliot cites. Fellow academic, not wanting to impose stereotypes on her son, she and her husband raised their children in gender neutral ways. So this son wanted to wear 
hair clips to nursery school, no problem, put him in. He came home, didn't complain about being teased. But then the mom talked to the teacher and she said, yeah, the boys kept saying he was a girl because he had slides. So what did the boy say? No, say, no, Professor Bem's well-taught son had countered, going on to insist that he was indeed a boy because he had, quote, a penis and testicles. To prove the point, the little boy pulled down his trousers. But the other boy was not persuaded, and he replied, everyone has a penis. Only girls wear hair slides. So that is an excellent example of the way in which gendered signs are floating signifiers or arbitrary signs. There are, in fact, signs of gender that uh, cannot be called arbitrary. As you learned in the last lecture by Richard, it's not entirely clear that the maleness is definitely expressed in the uh, possession of a penis and genitalia is more along a continuum. There's more intersex people than, um, uh, the, the, there are intersex people who do not fall clearly into one or another, but it's hard to deny that the penis is a kind of natural sign of being a man. The little boy is of course wrong about the, everyone having a penis, but in a way he's put his finger on the fact that it's often those arbitrary signs, those signs that have no real innate connection to the world out there. Those are the ones that are the most powerful, culturally significant, compelling. Um, so there's no natural relationship between hair slides and girls. It comes only from a, a position in a system of symbols, a system of related dichotomies. We're classifying animals, as Cloud W. Strauss said so many years ago, as you read it early in the semester. So these, these contrasting symbols, hair clip, no hair clip, long hair, short hair, dress, pants, dolls, trucks, and of course, pink and blue. Pink and blue. Now I'm going to let you um, explore the history of pink and blue, which is quite a recent history. These very, very strong signs now are uh, an invented tradition which doesn't um, make it any the less uh, persuasive. Have a look at uh, Smithsonian Magazine coverage of work by uh, historian Joe Pauletti, writing about the history of pink and blue. And you will see this, this picture. This is a boy or a girl. My daughter said, oh, of course it's a girl. She has long hair and she's wearing a dress. She's wearing girl shoes. She has a girl hat. As you'll see once you've read the, um, the piece, uh, that is not the case. This is gender neutral clothing worn by both girls and boys at the turn of the 20th century, so the late 19th century. And this is a quite a famous person, the future president of the United States, the longest serving president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Fast forward a hundred years and we get Eden Wood, beauty pageant queen who started her career at 14 months. We now have highly, highly gendered clothes and things for babies and little children, something that is very, very weird in the history of human societies and in our own society. So I want you to discuss in your tutorials why this might be. And again, Joe Pauletti's work uh, tells a compelling story about that. Also, uh, ABC's Checkout the other week had a section on gendered marketing, which also quoted Pauletti's uh, work, interestingly, so have a look at that and an article on gendered toys by The Guardian. So how is it that we get from FDR here to the little beauty queen here? And she is, that is in fact a live child and not a um, doll. Okay, so I'm gonna leave you with that, but some general points before I turn to the Melanesia 
material about gender socialization. In all societies, people categorically distinguish between male and female. They ascribe different characteristics to each sex and expect different sorts of behavior, although there's a great variability in how different genders are expected to act. They're often taken as natural, but not a matter of socialization and not a matter of individual choice. So the puzzle arises in that astounding cross-cultural diversity in the kinds of characteristics assigned to men and women, and I will get to the work of Margaret Mead here, but I'll quote her initially um, on the basis of her study of three different societies at Papua New Guinea. She says, many if not all of the personality traits which we have called masculine or feminine are as lightly linked to sex as are the clothing, manners, and the form of headdress that a society at any given period assigns to either sex. So men are aggressive, women are passive. Well, not necessarily. There's minimal evidence that most, the most culturally significant differences between men and women are hardwired as a result of our evolutionary heritage. And that's what's so interesting about Lise Elliott's work and why I have drawn her into the conversation is that she was looking for, she was looking for differences in our brain structures and she couldn't really find anything that explained the degree to which we elaborate any underlying sex and gender differences. Gender socialization. Much socialization is completely unintentional, even unconscious, sometimes contradictory to uh, ideology. So in my case, my ideology was very much against my daughter becoming a princess, and yet somehow the world around her socialized her for a couple of years to uh, imagine herself as a princess. And there may be profound contradictions between what, what people say and what they do. And now this is true of gender socialization and all sorts of other socializations, class socialization, ethnic socialization, and so on. It's not just parents or adults who socialize children. Other children play an incredibly important role. Remember the picture of the nursery school kid who might play with girl toys if there's not another kid in the room, but is certainly not going to do it if there's another kid in the room. And finally, want to suggest that gendered relationships are often constituted through, expressed through, or mediated by things which themselves are also gendered. And pay attention to the reading on ships, um, the gender of ships in the Callan reader, because there's an example of how our gender, we read our gendered social relationships onto uh, uh, a world of things. And finally, before I end this segment, I want to impress upon you that, I, that you know, in a, in, a, in a kind of high school understanding of social norms and things, we say things like, society tells us to do this, that, and the other thing, and, you know, and we want to maybe not do what society tells us, or, this, or we think it's good that society tells us this, and so forth. Society isn't a thing. Society never tells us anything, and, and all norms and, um, norms and values are all really contradictory and paradoxical. Um, and I think that that picture of the highly gendered young girl beauty queen that is so pervasive in a certain popular mass culture in our society today, that's, that is completely contradictory with the explicit ideals we hold about gender equity in all sorts of realms of life. And yet both of those things are part of our social world. So I'll leave it there.